Hello nation. Today we're going to talk about why the A1C sucks and why time and range is so important. The information I'm about to tell you is in our newsletter and on our blog post. So I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg here. Now the A1C has been around for a long time. It's really designed to tell us patients and our caregivers what our average blood sugar has been over the past two to three months. So for example, an average blood sugar of 150 equates to an A1C of 7%. If your A1C of 8%, that means your average blood sugar is 180. And if your A1C is 9%, your average blood sugar is like 210. So, and you can see the graph in the article. Now, why does the A1C suck? This slide sort of says it all. In the curve above, this patient is bouncing from super high to super low. And in the patient at the bottom, they're really in range most of the time. They have the same A1C. So your A1C says nothing about glycemic fluctuations. Now, in the olden days, and even today, uh, you know, people can't go around pricking their finger a zillion times a day, write them all down, take an average number, and, and then figure out what your A1C is. But with the advent of continuous glucose monitors that I'll talk about in a few minutes, we can really get a very accurate average, and then from that average, calculate what your estimated A1C would be. In fact, I say to younger doctors all the time, what's the most accurate way to estimate the average blood sugar over the past two to three months? They raise their hand, oh, it's the A1C. I say, no, it's the average blood sugar over the past two to three months. We weren't able to get this information until continuous glucose monitors became available. Now, additional reasons why the A1C can be very misleading. Situations where you are anemic or your blood count's low, you know, you're African American, uh, you're pregnant, you have chronic kidney disease, you have liver disease. These are all uh, conditions that can give you a spurious A1C value. The laboratory can, can make errors. At UCSD where I work and where I see my caregiver, for a period of time, their A1C was about 1% higher than, than the accurate value. And that really, <laughs> that bothered me because everyone thought my control was horrible and it became part of my medical record. The younger doctors that think, oh, Dr. Edelman, he's always got perfect control, they're going into my medical record against HIPAA violation. And they say, ah, oh, look how bad his control is. And, and so the, the lab could be off as well. So we're always gonna be using A1C. It's an important test, but what are additional, what we call glycemic indices? The very first one, and the most important, is time and range. This patient up here has a reduced time and range. Time and range is defined as a blood sugar between 70 and 180. This patient down below has a great time and range. Here's a picture of one of the continuous glucose monitoring downloads. You can see the average blood sugar, 152. It's an A1C of around 7, pretty darn good. Time and range is 60%. Our, our goal is kind of 70%, and you can see that 36% of this patient's values are above 180. So it, it gives you an area to focus on. Then you go to the 24-hour profile, and you try to find what time of day the blood sugars are the highest. It also gives you the standard deviation, which tells you how much bounce you're getting. So remember that uh, you know continuous glucose monitors, although they're not available to everybody, mainly those with type 1 diabetes and those with type 2 on insulin, they eventually will become available to everybody. And I think they are, they are incredible devices that can tell us patients how our diabetes is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, the A1C does suck in many ways. We still need it. Uh, but remember, the value can be off and it also doesn't tell you all the important information about your diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's really all about time and range. So long, nation.